From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday. It's an anxious time. I feel like I'm working to keep this panicky, uneasy feeling in check, and it's always in danger of being set off. Like a headline about the earthquake's devastation in Haiti, or a text message from my sister about a COVID exposure. It gets me. It's enough to distract me, to make my heart race. And yet, we're supposed to carry on, to focus up at work, and even to crush it. I mean, this is hard. And for me, I'm not even a person who struggles with clinical anxiety. For many, many people, including a lot of our listeners, anxiety can be downright debilitating. But as tough as this time is, one important thing has changed for the better. More and more, our mental health has become something we can talk about. And the talking, it helps. A big reason it's okay for me to talk about my own anxiety is our guest today, Maura Aarons Mealy. Now, several years ago, Maura started a podcast called The Anxious Achiever. It's a show about how wildly successful people, entrepreneurs, CEOs, even Guy Raz, how they navigate anxiety and other mental health challenges at work. These stories make us brave. They make us more comfortable talking with each other. Now, Maura is a model of business success. She founded a social impact agency called Women Online, and earlier this year, she sold it to a larger communications firm. Today, Maura will tell us about her own journey with depression and anxiety. She'll talk about what she's learned about anxiety through her show, and we'll break down the challenges of this long pandemic period together. We don't make anxiety go away. That's not how it works. We live with it. Maura is going to share some perspective on exactly how we do that. Here's Maura. I always want to acknowledge that I am a very privileged person and I had the privilege and nothing to lose. (laughs) Several people (laughs) called it the crazy show. Several people who should have known better. (laughs) I worked for myself at the time. I'm a white, like cisgender, very highly educated, pretty well off woman who can talk about mental health with very little consequence. So I did. And I think that part of what my dream would be for the show, I want to see the day when the kind of people, still sadly largely men, who show up to ring the bell on the stock exchange are in corporate boardrooms talking about quarterly earnings disclose their mental illness. There's something I call the daughter syndrome in my life. Ever since I, it's been about eight years now, started talking about mental health and working where I'd meet powerful white guys and they'd be like, my daughter really loves your work. My wife really loves your work. (laughs) And they'd tell me all about the anxiety of their wife or daughter. And I'd be like, dude, I know it's not just your wife and daughter. You might have it too. (laughs) Do you think that it is a desire not to disclose or like a beat beyond that, not even necessarily having the awareness for it? Mm, That's interesting. I've had CEOs say to me, I have a lot of responsibility on my shoulder. If I'm going to take people's money, I have to prove to them that I am not a risk. And I understand that. I think that our societal awareness has moved past that you are not a risk if you have mental health challenges and you're heading a company. But I think that perceptions are slow to change. And like all taboos, it is just a really tough one to shift because it's about shame and vulnerability for many people. So let's talk about anxiety for a second. It's in the title of your show. A lot of people would qualify themselves as feeling anxious. Mm-hmm. I certainly would. And anxious person just sort of by default. But I also think that there's a a difference between feeling anxious and having a clinical diagnosis of anxiety. And I'm curious how you think about those things. I'm not a licensed healthcare anything, so I, I should say that. But I've studied and been in therapy and have half an MSW, so... I know a little bit. Sometimes I would say I don't think it matters. If you're anxious, you're anxious. I think that the pandemic has been a real wake-up call for many people because they may have skipped through life not feeling anxious, and then all of a sudden they can't sleep, and they are trembling, and they can't concentrate, and they sit down at their computer and are full of deep, dark thoughts, and they don't know why. And it's natural. How could you not be anxious? How could you not be anxious? 
over this past few years. <laughs> like, really, I literally show me someone who's not. And then there are people like me. I have clinical anxiety. I also have major depressive disorder. There are many days in my career where I have not been able to get out of bed or I've not been able to travel or I've, I've literally been unable to perform because of my mental illness. And yet I've done a heck of a lot. I'm doing pretty well. And I, and I felt like, you know, that's important. So it's a spectrum like all things, but everyone's experience is valid. Well, listen, Mara, you've, you've done a heck of a lot. You've been a successful entrepreneur. You've written about how one does this. Talk to us a little bit about your own journey with this. How did you feel about this aspect of yourself at the beginning of your career? I came out of college hungry to be big in media and got a lot of jobs because it was boom times and then quit them all and cried and quit and cried. Really could not figure out what was wrong with me. I spent all of my 20s feeling depressed and anxious. I had over 10 jobs. I lived on three different continents. I was always searching. I was on 15 different antidepressant and various medications. I was on antipsychotic medications. I had panic attacks. I mean, for a privileged girl, it was a pretty miserable way to spend your 20s. And when I hit 30, I thought, I'm not cut out for anything successful. I'm done. Like, I can't hack it. And I stopped working and I went to grad school and I started freelancing because for me, the experience of being in the successful work world was so twinned with feeling anxious and depressed all the time. And I had to figure out why. I had to unpack that. Were, were there any turning points along the way as you began to try to unpack that for yourself? There was a huge turning point when I was 30 where I had the love of a really good person in my life who said, take some time, my beloved husband, Nico. And so I did stop working full time and I went to social work school because I really wanted to understand <laughs> therapy and psychology. And I started freelancing. And for me, freelancing meant freedom. It meant listening to my own needs instead of showing up at 7 a.m. to the office because everyone else did. And I realized that I love to work. I am insanely ambitious. I'm good at what I do. I just have to do it differently than some people. And as I got older and I learned and I matured, I learned to live with my anxiety and depression and have really managed, I think, to crack the nut. Sometimes I've had bad times. I've been hospitalized. But by and large, I am most days in a really good place and hyper-functional and really at peace with who I am. You can't ask for more than that. As you tell that story, I realize like we're checking in. We're both around the same age. We're, we're in the middle. We're in the middle of our lives. And being able to take a step back and look at the long arc of the early part of our career, it's easy when looking at the long arc of your career to see the success. You can't help but celebrate it. But I think it's the truth of one's professional life that we live in the micro moments and that we think that they're really weighted and that if we need to draw back for a day or a week or a month, that that has somehow draws to a close our professional en endeavors or ambitions. It's an ending per se. And your description of your 20s, it just resonates so much because I had something similar. I called it the emotional flu, mm, yeah. but it was really just uh, like a version of a panic attack. And there were definitely days I just didn't show up for work. I mean, that's that's how intense it was. And I thought during the time, everybody else around me has got this figured out. I am the only person who doesn't have this figured out. And I can't let anybody know because if anybody knows and I am found out, then I will lose my job and everything will come apart. I don't even think I really remembered that until I heard you recount your story in the way that you did. I, I like to talk about my 20s because... I think that we glamorize youth so much in this in this world, right? And yeah, you can look at my resume in my 20s and it was pretty cool. I was successful. But when I look back and feel it, the trauma is deep. And so I know I'm not alone. I know that most of us just have a lot of learning and living and growing up to do and our prefrontal lobes are still developing, right? Like there is stuff, <laughs> our hormones are going crazy. Like we are not 
steady in our 20s. And so I I try to talk about that because I want people to feel hopeful. And I also like I'm going to be 45 soon. And I just feel like I am just getting going. I love being middle aged. This moment of the middle of our lives is like is pretty magical. And it is amazing to me how often on Hello Monday, we have guests who didn't even stumble upon the thing that they loved. And that became their largest professional success and their personal success until well after the middle of their lives. hundred percent. And most entrepreneurs, frankly, are not young tech geniuses. They're people in their 40s and 50s. So, you know, the whole framework needs to shift. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, Maura shares her experience managing a new team in the current environment. And we're back. The first part of my conversation with Maura really focused on self-awareness, dealing with anxiety and depression as an individual. But of course, Maura also manages others, a whole team. And I wanted to understand how she shapes the conversation around mental health in that context. Well, it's funny when you're like a poster child, right? Because because you feel that you should both be more open and wiser than you actually are. So I've been going through an interesting time because I recently sold the small business that I started 10 years ago and have merged my business and my team and myself into a larger company, all remote. So most of us have never met each other. It's been really stressful. And one of the things that I keep saying to myself and talking about with the team is, we have a lot of feelings around this. Sometimes I don't think you need to say more than that. We are having a lot of feelings around this change, and they are uncomfortable. And then giving people sort of space to think, oh, yeah, this is really making me uncomfortable. What in particular is making me uncomfortable? Is it new expectations around presenteeism and screen time? Is it the fact that I have to be accountable in a different way? I have to learn new people's names. I mean, they can be small things, but so much about work seemingly requires us to go through uncomfortable, disruptive change without actually being able to stand up and say, this is really hard. I'm like really anxious right now. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like, we've just been through a global (laughs) pandemic where we literally had to change everything about the way we worked overnight. Right. And the fact that many of us don't feel like we can stand up and be like, I'm freaking out. It seems weird to me. I could not agree with you more. And I've also been thinking a lot about the distinction between speaking our feelings and finding resolve. And that we often are, are looking to find the answer to a problem. When actually making the space to simply voice the problem or voice the discomfort is, in fact, the solution. I'm curious if you've seen that at all in the people that you've spoken to. Surfing the waves of discomfort, right? If you're a mindfulness aficionado, the goal is never to not have discomfort because that's impossible. The goal is to be able to say, I'm feeling discomfort. I'm going to stay steady. And and maybe I'm not going to react. You know, I think that so much. I always use email as an example because I think anybody can relate. Email has become something that I think makes many of us anxious because we feel the need to instantly dive in and respond. It's an unconscious reaction, right? Many of us walk around all day long being constantly kind of triggered and made anxious by all the emails and all the slacks coming in, whether or not they are substantive or need to be responded to or not, they have become that in our brain. And so we are constantly walking around reacting in an anxious way. And we call that work. (laughs) But really what we're doing (laughs) is reacting in an anxious way. (laughs) And if we were better able to get the email, read it, and think, hmm, do I need to respond? You know, process it, and then think about responding. So much could change overnight. Yeah, Gosh, that's really true. That sound that the the Slack slack icon makes that... Right. Your heart Uh, jumps a little bit, right? Like a little bit. Oh, yeah. Entirely. That's anxiety. And I try to do all the self-help things you're supposed to do to help with that stuff on the front end, Bora. And and one of the challenges with all of those things, and by that I mean like regularly I go through and I turn off all the notification systems or – Maybe I'll build time into the middle of my day to take a walk because that is like a straight out of the self-help tutorial for how to 
address the anxiety that in particular this last year has brought up. But one truth of this past year that I have learned is that the anxiety has been so overwhelming that at times I I'm paralyzed and can't deploy any of the self-help hacks. Mm -hmm. And it's just been overpowering, even for those of us who don't experience day-to-day a lot of anxiety. And I'm curious what if you have any ideas about like what that will do to the context of our lives as we return to the new normal. The most fascinating thing, and I know you've explored this on your show recently as well, is that our brains... When people are saying they're done, which is something we hear a lot, right? Our brains are literally done. And we have been operating on a kind of neural high alert for so many months now. What I really worry about is that we're going to dive back in full throttle to traveling and commuting without letting our bodies and our brains and our nervous system literally press reset. What's that going to do to all of us? I can't even think about doctors and frontline workers who literally have been through unbelievable trauma and have not had a break. That is unthinkable to me. Even for us knowledge workers, it's just the systems are going to short circuit at some point. And so I almost wish that we could call a little bit of a sabbatical for everyone for two weeks. You know when your computer gets too hot and you have to just unplug it for 10 full minutes? <laughs> That's kind of what I think we need. Yes, I do know that. (laughs) I want everybody to just be able to unplug for 10 full minutes or two full weeks because we need that reset. We are not coming back fresh because the anxiety and the ambient trauma and the news alerts and Donald Trump and the pandemic and all the social change and upheaval has literally maxed us, literally. I want people to be able to take a vacation this summer. I really think it's so important. And if you're a manager, understand that neurobiologically people need to unplug and encourage a vacation without the, but don't worry, I'll be checking email. Like, can we just cut out that appendage? That is a great idea. An important idea. Where I guess the place that I'd I'd want to bring us back to is we talked about the mess of learning that came in your 20s. What's happened to your mental health in the context of your life, in the middle of your life? It's still here for me. I don't ever want to gloss over that because it's not true. And for a lot of people, you're not going to get better. (laughs) I interviewed a wonderful entrepreneur on my show, Vikas Shah, who's so successful. He got the Queen's Honors. He's a CBE. And he said that really, for him, there's no recovery. There's no cure. There's just management. And I think that for a lot of people who walk through life with any kind of chronic illness, there's no cure. You know, it's your companion and you manage it. But the thing that makes me so strong as someone with anxiety and depression is that I know myself, I know my boundaries, and it makes me able to manage other people because I can read them better. I have empathy, I think. (laughs) And I approach work from a very different way than someone who might be anxious and not in touch with it and just sort of acting out via anger and micromanaging and mansplaining and all the unconscious ways we act out our anxiety, or someone who may not be blessed with, with anxiety and depression. In that way, it really is your super strength. It, it's it's part of me. It's like I'm six foot two. I have these skills and I'm an anxious depressive. And I think it drives my husband crazy. It can make relationships challenging. But I really do think it's key to my career. That was Maura Aaron's Mealy. Earlier this summer, I got to join her on her show. It's called The Anxious Achiever, and she really pushed me to think. You can go and find that episode or really any episode of Anxious Achiever, and I hope you will. You can find it on Harvard Business Review's website or anywhere you listen to podcasts. It's really easy to see anxiety and depression and other mental health issues as burdens to bear. But Maura also points out the way that understanding them helps her to be more successful. And I'm wondering if you, like Mora, 
might see your mental health challenges or even just your pandemic era anxiety as helpful. Secret weapons of a sort. I want to talk about this this week on Office Hours. We'll go live like we always do at 3 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. To join us, please find us on the LinkedIn news page or send us an email at hellomonday at linkedin.com and we'll send you the link. Now, if today's episode really resonated with you, I hope you will consider rating us and reviewing us on Apple or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It really helps listeners find the show. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Sarah Storm with help from Taisha Henry. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Uriando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Michaela Greer, Victoria Taylor, and Gianna Prudente help keep us self-aware. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Desi Hempel. We're back next Monday. Thanks for listening. Maura, when you're holding the mic, do you forget that you're holding it and just chat after a while? Or do you do you kind of always keep it in your mind I forget. that you're, do you're you? recording? Yeah. Uh, constantly. <laughs> like, m- now mine is all attached, all fancy attached. Oh, oh wow. Um, but usually I, like you, am in my closet and I'm constantly, like, trying to arrange things in exactly the right way. <laughs>